I'm smiling because I spent 20 minutes this morning after I got here looking for this Bible thinking I must have left it at home and I walk out here and it's laying on the table. So now I got two to preach from, so y'all are in trouble today. I'm just letting you know that right now. So, um, all right, so here's the question as we get started. What is something that you do not have, maybe that somebody else has that you wish that you had and you would give anything to have it? And yes, it could be Jesse's girl. I hope it's not, but it could be. But what is that for you as you think about that? Now, as you think about it, let me just take a moment and say welcome uh, to this week's teaching uh, of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. Uh, We're looking at uh, spending the summer on the Mount, looking at this famous teaching that Jesus gave. Uh, It's found in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7. And uh, so we're at a section in his teaching where Jesus has been accused of trying to do away with the Old Testament. Uh, the, the, the religious leaders of his day who didn't like him, who didn't agree with him, uh, made this accusation against him that, that he was really just trying to do away with the Old Testament or, or downplay its importance. And so after affirming that this is not what he was actually doing, but he was actually doing just the opposite, he said that he came to fulfill everything that was talked about and promised in the Old Testament. And after doing that, he launches into these six, we'll call them mini teachings, maybe mini sermons. I, I don't know that I would go that far. But these teachings prove that, uh, that, that what he was being accused of doing was really just the opposite of what he was actually doing. Uh, some said by doing away with the Old Testament that what he was trying to do was downplay it, lower the bar. And, uh, and what we're going to see And as we saw last week, that instead of lowering the bar, he's actually raising the bar. So all these people who think that the Old Testament was hard to follow, hard to keep up with, hard to live up to, uh, man, they're about to find out that uh, Jesus is going to take it to a whole nother level as we're looking at as we go through this. Now, each of these six sections, these little mini uh, messages that he gives, uh, begins with these two statements. He says, you have heard it said... And he quotes something from the Old Testament. And then he says, but I say to you. And, uh, and so he, he does this to kind of say, look, uh, you've, you know what it, the Old Testament says, but, but here's what I want you to understand. Here's what I, I really want you to get out of that. Now, today's topic of discussion, for example, looks like it's about adultery. In fact, if you were to open your Bible and look in Matthew chapter 5, where we're at, Uh, these little headings that they put at the top, it actually says adultery on it. But just like last week, uh, we find that the the, the spirit of the law is far more reaching than the letter of the law. And so I want to dive into this week's teaching with you and see what Jesus had to say. So we're in Matthew chapter 5, we're going to start in verse 27, and it says this. Jesus says, you have heard that it was said you shall not commit adultery. Now, all of us have probably heard that. Whether we knew where it came from or not, uh, we knew that. Most of us know, recognize that it's one of the Ten Commandments. It's one of the 613 laws that are mentioned uh, and established in the Old Testament, much like the one last week. And this one, again, makes the top ten list. It's one of the, the Ten Commandments that's actually given. So Jesus says, you've heard this, and you know what it says. Thou shalt not commit adultery. But then he goes on and he says this. But I tell you that anyone who looks at a woman lustfully has already committed adultery with her in his heart. So instead of lowering the bar, right off the bat, we see that Jesus is raising the bar. And he's addressing an even bigger issue. The letter of the law was don't commit adultery. But the spirit of the law deals with something even greater, and that's lust, which is where adultery ultimately comes from. Uh, it's what happens on the I- inwardly before it ever happens outwardly. The letter of the law deals with the act where the spirit of the law deals with the heart. And if you know anything about Jesus, if you know anything about God, God's always about getting to the heart of the matter. And this is true with this week's teaching as well. This week, Jesus says, you can commit adultery just by looking lustfully 
at a woman. Now, traditionally, and I want to say this, this goes both ways. This isn't just about a guy, but a woman can have this same issue. This can be the, just as a, a real for a woman as it is for a man. And, and so when we read this, this isn't just about beating up on men because women wrestle with this as, as well. Now, traditionally, we understand that adultery happens uh, when a married individual has an inappropriate relationship with another individual that may or may not be married, okay? And, and, but we understand that traditionally that's what it is. Now, Jesus raises the bar and says that adultery is really the result of something uh, almost equally dangerous. Uh, and, and he goes back to where this really begins, and, and it's this idea of lust. Lust usually deals with sexual desires. Today, I'm going to broaden the net here just a little bit. And I think it's still within, within keeping of what Jesus is driving at uh, today as we look at this. Uh, there are other words that uh, often get used in, this, in place of lust or right along with it that mean the exact same thing. Uh, we, we see them all throughout Scripture. We're going to see them today. But two other words that pop up along with lust is the word covet and the word desire. And all three of these words are interchangeable and carry the same idea with it. It's an unhealthy, sinful wanting of something that is not yours for the having. And we've all been there. We've all coveted. We've all had these unhealthy desires, sinful desires, and we get that. And that's why, along with the command not to commit adultery, we also find this command in the top 10 or the 10 commandments. In fact, it's the 10th commandment, and it says this. You shall not covet, everybody say covet. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or his car or his truck or his boat or his patio out back that looks so much better than yours or anything else that is your neighbor's. Okay, so along with that, now again, this is one of those laws that, that if you really think about it, shouldn't even have to be spelled out, just like last week as we talked about anger. I mean, we should get this, all right? It, it, it's just, to a certain degree, it's common sense, but we have to understand the source of where this comes from and why this has become such a big deal. First, uh, John, uh, one of the early followers of Christ, wrote this in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. He says, For everything in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life comes not from the Father, but from the world. So there's this pattern, first of all, that we see just in this verse that's going to set up something that, that I want you to catch. So there, there, there's this, this pattern of lust, if you will. There's something that we see. After seeing it, then we desire it. And after desiring it, we do everything that we can to actually get it, to take hold of it. But Jesus says, or, or John actually says, that this doesn't come from God the Father. This is, this is not what you can expect from his kingdom, but it comes from somewhere else. Lust is first introduced and experienced in the Garden of Eden. So if we were to go all the way back to the very beginning, uh, of Genesis, we know that, that God creates the first man, the first woman. He puts them in this perfect place. He lays down these gar ground rules and said, listen, if you just follow these rules, you're going to experience life to the max. And, uh, and so this is taking place. And then one day, this serpent, the, the evil one, shows up and he plants this thought in Eve's head. And I think it's something that she had never thought about before. The thought never crossed her mind until the evil one comes along and says, hey, you know that tree in the middle of the garden that God says you can't eat from? And she's like, yeah. And, you know, he said if we eat from it, we'll die. And he goes, listen, you're not going to die. God's just saying that. In fact, God's trying to keep something from you. And so for the first time, Eve begins to think about what this evil one said, and she's fixated on this tree in the middle of the garden. In fact, here's what it says in Genesis chapter 3, verse 6. When the woman saw, everybody say saw. When the woman saw that the fruit of the tree was good for food and pleasing to the eye and also desirable, everybody say desirable, for gaining wisdom, she what? She took some and she ate it. And we know that she also gave to her husband, who also took some and ate it, because he saw that it was good and it was desirable, all right? So we see this pattern. 
Now, we know what happened. We know the devastating results of what happened that day because we're still living uh, with those consequences ourselves. We're still experiencing the devastating results of what took place that day. But I want you to notice the cycle. She saw, she desired, and then she took. One of the most famous acts of lust and adultery uh, is found uh, really with, with one of Israel's most famous kings, if not their most famous king. In fact, if I give you half of the, the, the duo, you probably know who it, the other half was, David and Bathsheba, all right? So, so we're familiar with that. Even if you don't know the Bible, if you don't know the story, we know that there, there was an inappropriate relationship that took place. I, I want to just briefly look at this because I want you to see this pattern that continues that goes along with lust. So in 1 Samuel chapter 11, the story begins this way. In the spring of the year, the time when kings go out to battle, David sent, David didn't go even though he should have gone, all right? David sent Joab, his servants, and his servants with him, and all of Israel. And they ravaged the Ammonites and besieged Rabah. But David remained at Jerusalem. And in verse 2, the story continues. It happened, reads just like a big novel, doesn't it? It happened late one afternoon. When David arose from his couch and was walking on the roof of the king's house, so David's chilling. Instead of out doing what kings should be doing at this time, he's chillaxing on his, on his sofa in his palace. And it says, so he takes a walk that he saw, everybody say saw, from the roof a woman bathing. And the woman was very beautiful. Verse 3 says, and David sent and what? Inquired. So, so he's, he saw and now there's this desire, he's, he's wanting to know more all right, about the woman. To which one person answered and said, Is this not Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? And again, we know how the story goes from there, how it ends. She gets pregnant, and David has to have her husband killed, trying to cover it all up and so that nobody would know. But it's interesting because here we are thousands of years later, and we still know what happened, don't we? In fact, it's recorded in this book so that we would all forever know what took place. Even though David did his best to cover it up, God made sure that it was brought to light so that we could all learn a lesson from this. James, the half-brother of Jesus, gives us this insight and warning. He says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial, for when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who, uh, who love him. Let no one say when he is tempted, I am being tempted by God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, and he himself tempts no one. And then James continues, and he says, but each person, that's you and me, is tempted when he is what? Lured and enticed by his own desire. Then desire, when it has conceived, gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is fully grown, brings forth death. So there's a lot to learn just from what he says. When we're tempted, we can't blame it on anybody else. And when we give in, we can't say, well, the devil made me do it. It was my, me looking at something I shouldn't have been looking at probably to begin with, or I looked too long, and that look turned into a desire, and that desire got the best of me, and I gave in, and then sin, when it has fully grown up, uh, leads to death. And we get that. We go from seeing to desiring to getting, only instead of getting what we want, we normally get gotten ourselves in that, don't we? Instead of getting what we think we want, what we want usually ends up getting us. Uh, for me, so I was saying about this, I, uh, I often joke about this, I love to go into Home Depot and, uh, because I find things in there, one, that I didn't know existed, and two, I find things that I didn't even know that I needed until I saw it, and then I wanted it. And then what happens? Sometimes I make it out of the store without buying it. But because I looked too long and I thought too long, guess what? I eventually go back and get that, which I probably didn't really need. And I don't know about you, uh, but I have a garage full of things that I thought that I needed that I really didn't need. Anybody else have a garage or a building full of stuff like that? We all do, don't we? Uh, we, we, we see it at commercials. 
the commercials are the worst sometimes because this, this commercial comes on and we're like, did you see that? I, my phone won't do that. Oh, I got to go get that phone so that, wow, we didn't need it all this time, but we think that we need it and we respond to that. We, we get it. Now, listen, this is much more serious than that, but we all can relate very well to this. Because of a hidden, because uh, of lust, a hidden, um, I'll call it an empire, exists. It's called human trafficking. Boys and girls are, are used to fulfill the unimaginable lustful desires of mankind. Men and women hire themselves out whether literally physically or maybe just through a screen on a computer, but they hire themselves out. And they make a ton of money off of this because we understand that sex sells. That's why you see so much of it in commercials. But, again, we understand the results of that too, don't we? Jobs, reputations get lost. I've read stories and watched stories over the past several months where where school teachers hire themselves out to make extra money, to only get caught and lose their job, lose their reputation. And we get that. Families get destroyed, and it just never ends, does it? Now, I know we get this, and I know that we understand what Jesus is driving at. The question is this. What do we do about it? What do we do about it? Can we do anything about it? Because it's hard to unsee what's been seen, and it's even harder to undo what's been done. So what can we do about this? How do we combat it? Well, Jesus offers in this short teaching a way to combat lust. And it's going to seem very extreme if you don't know what he says next, but here's the deal. If we were to follow his advice, I promise you that we would break this cycle very quickly. Let's look and see what Jesus says. If your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to be thrown into hell. He continues. He says, and if your right hand causes you to stumble, cut it off, throw it away. It's better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell. Now, some would say, that Jesus was using what we would call today hyperboil, this extreme uh, illustration, example of what we should do to combat this. And others would argue that, that Jesus literally meant this. And, and re regardless, I would say this, no matter how he meant it, if we were to take what he says seriously, uh, it would be a game changer. And we need to take it seriously because we all know the devastating effects, results, consequences of lust, of coveting, and of desire. So how do we, citizens of the kingdom of heaven, fight back against lust? Last week, talking with a father uh, after the service who had recently lost his son, he, in our conversation, he said, I, I, I would often tell my son this. He says, you will never be satisfied with what you don't have until you're satisfied with what you do have. And I don't know why that has stuck with me all week long. Uh, and and I, I just thought, you know, isn't that really the goal for all of us? To be satisfied, to be content with what we have. Because until we're satisfied and content with what we have, we'll never be content and satisfied with what we don't have. I just think it's great advice for all of us to follow. So how do we get there? Well, I want to give you some I'm going to say ideas, some things that, that, that if, if we will do based on Scripture that will help us combat this thing called lust. And the first one that I'm going to give you is this. Consecrate yourself to God. Consecrate yourself to God. Now, I know that's a big word, and, and some of you are like, what does that even mean? Very simply, it means to prepare yourself. It means to set yourself apart not just from something, but to something. And we'll, we'll, hopefully that'll make sense as we go through this. It also involves this idea of purifying yourself, 
of, okay, we've, we've done these things, we're not happy with them, we're, 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 you know, we're, we're sorry. So how do we then correct that? How do we get back into good graces with God? Now, this first point, I'm going to give you three sub-points, but let me show you this verse in, in Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. So, so here's what happened. Uh, Moses has led the children of Israel out of Egypt. And, and he's passed off the baton of leadership to Joshua. And Joshua is about to take the, the nation of Israel into the promised land. And he says, before we do this, here's what you need to do. Joshua told the people, consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. I read that verse this week, and I thought, isn't that really what we all want? We want to see God do some incredible stuff in our lives. We want to see God do some incredible stuff through our lives. Well, the way that happens, the way we get to see God do amazing things is we have to first consecrate ourselves to God. And this was Joshua's advice to the, to the whole nation of Israel. Listen, he says, you need to do this because tomorrow God's going to do some incredible stuff in your life. And I'm convinced that if we will take to heart what we're looking at and talking about this morning, that we are going to experience, some, experience God do some amazing things in our lives. So how do we consecrate ourselves to God? Number one, it starts with prayer. It starts with prayer. Psalms 51 verse 10 says the, uh, this. This is a prayer. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence. You, you, you see, here's what happens when we pursue those things that, that we shouldn't. When we go after the things that aren't ours to have to begin with, there's this separation that takes place between us and God. And we've got to deal with that. We've got to get that out of the way. So he says, create in me a clean heart, because in the heart we're going to see is where it all begins. And renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. This is what, and restore to me the joy of your salvation. And I love this part, last part. And uphold me with a willing spirit. Here's the prayer. God, search me. Show me things that are in my life that are not honoring to you. And God, create a clean heart in me. And then give me a willing spirit to follow through on what I'm about to commit to you. And God promises that he will do that if we're genuine in our prayers to him. So it starts with prayer. The second thing is confession. This is a spiritual act of worship that I don't think any of us do enough. I don't think we take the time sometimes to really stop and go, okay, what is in my life that's not honoring to God? What do I need to confess to God in agreement with him that this isn't good for me? This isn't God's best for my life. In a lot of cases, it's, just, it, it's the thing that's in the way of my relationship with God. John, uh, early follower of Christ, said this, if we confess our sins... That's a big if, because I just don't think we do this enough, myself included. If we confess our sin, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. You know those things that we can't unsee, those things that we can't undo? God says if we'll come to him and genuinely ask for him to create a clean heart within us, and if we'll confess those things to God, the promise is from God that he will forgive us and then he'll cleanse us. And again, this is what consecrating looks like. It's this idea of purifying ourselves before God, setting ourselves up for God to do incredible things in our lives. Now, sometimes we have to be reminded of this. Because sometimes there you say, but you don't know what I've seen. You don't know what I've done. And, and I would say that's true about me. You don't know what I've seen. You don't know what I've done. And there are times that the evil one loves to, to remind me of some of that stuff. And, and sometimes I have to sit down before God and go, God, I, I know I've confessed this stuff to you. And God, I believe based on the truth of your word that you have forgiven me of those things. And so I claim that forgiveness. And then, God, if there's anything new in my life that I need to get right with you, then let's take care of that now as well. And so it starts with prayer and confession. And then the third thing under this I wrote was memorization and meditation. I struggled with these two words I, to use one or the other, and I thought, you know, really it's about both, depending on how you want to look at it 
or understand it, but at the end of the day, it's really about doing both. Psalms 119, verse 9 and 11 says this. How can a young man, how can a young woman, how can an old man, how can an old woman, you put whatever you want to put there, keep his way pure by guarding it according to your word. And then he says, I've stored up your word in my heart. Why? That I might not sin against you. And so this idea of memorizing God's word. I, I, uh, when I went to Bible college, man, every single day, every single class I had, uh, there was at least one memory verse that we had to memorize for our quiz. Every single day, every class. And I, I would write them out on index cards and and driving, I lived in Florida at the time, driving from Clearwater over to Tampa, I would have these cards sitting on the dashboard of my truck, and I'd be memorizing all of those, these verses. And, and then I would stick them in a, a little file box, index uh, card box, and, and kept them for the longest time. But he, now, do I, do I have all of those verses still memorized? I, I don't. But a good chunk of them I do. And more importantly, because I have hidden those things in my heart, there are times where God's Spirit speaks to me and reminds me about a verse in the Bible. And sometimes I don't know where it's at. I don't remember where it's at. But I, I remember what it said, and I can easily and quickly go look it up. And God has used those verses over the years to encourage me, to convict me, to remind me, to point out sin in my life. And so this is why it's so important for us to take this word and not just memorize it, but then take time to meditate on it. There are times when, when I find myself doing that, thinking about, well, what did God really mean? How does that really apply to my life? And so I want to encourage you to do that because the end result is we do this so that we might not sin against God. And again, I think this will, is going to make even more sense as we go through this. So number one on the list. Consecrate yourself to God. Number two on the list, pay attention to the attention. Now, I've heard Trey uh, use this phrase a little differently, and so if you're wondering if I got it wrong, no, I don't, didn't get it wrong. He just uses it a, a different way than I do. He often says, pay attention to the tension. I'm saying pay attention to the attention. In other words, pay attention to what you're paying attention to. And as you do this, you may need to refocus your attention because you might not be thinking about the things that you need to be thinking about. Paul, an early follower of Christ, writer of much of our New Testament, uh, as, as we see throughout scriptures and, and, and we talk about the relevancy of this. So, so when Jesus taught, he taught on this subject. Then years later, Paul the Apostle comes along. He's teaching on this to every group of people because every group of people all throughout the ages struggle with these same things, okay? So we're not immune from this, we, and, and I think we get it. But listen to what he says to this first group of people in Colossians chapter 3. He says, set your minds on things that are above. Pay attention to the attention. What are you paying attention to? Are you paying attention to the things that really matter? And if not, then maybe you need to refocus your attention. Not on things that are on the earth, for you have died and your life is hidden with Christ and God. If the things that we're thinking about are not honoring to God, then we need to refocus. Here's what he says to another group in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. He says, finally, brothers, sisters, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Everybody say these things. We've got plenty to think about. We need to be thinking about these things, not those things. We need to pay attention to the attention. We need to pay attention to what we're paying attention to. And if we're not paying attention to these things, and we're paying attention to those things, then we need to refocus. Here's a great question for us to ask. What does God think about what I'm thinking about? Just stop and ask yourself randomly, middle of the day, God, what do you think about what I'm thinking about? can be very revealing, especially in the moment. All right, next on the list, watch what you watch. Watch what you watch. Psalms 101, verse 3 says this, I will not set before my eyes anything 
that is worthless. Some translations use the word vile. Some translations use the word uh, evil. Uh, you could put just about any negative word there. But the psalmist says, I will not look. Listen, if we make our, a, a choice ahead of time not to do something, the chances of us, of us not doing it go up exponentially. It's amazing if we predetermine that we're going to do something or not do something, when we find ourselves in that situation, we're, we're more apt to follow through. And so this is something that we should, we, this is a commitment that we should make to ourselves. I will not look with approval on anything worthless. Matthew chapter 6, I love what Jesus says in this. He says, the eye is the lamp of the body. So if your eye is healthy, your whole body will be full of light. But if your eye is bad, your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? The eye is the lamp of the body. If the eye is healthy, the whole body is healthy. It's full of light. But that's only because we're looking at the things we ought to be looking at. If we're watching and looking at things that we shouldn't be looking at, there's a darkness that begins to overtake us. And his, his question there at the, at the end, then if that light in you is darkness, how great is that darkness? And for some of us, we've gone down this road so far, we know that it's deep darkness within us. Now the good news is, as we're talking about, is God can replace that darkness with light. Job chapter 31, verse 1, Job makes this commitment. I have made a covenant with my eyes. How then can I gaze at a virgin or a young woman? And again, this sounds like it's all about guys, but, but girls, you're, you have to pay attention to this as well because this is just as much a battle for you as it is any man. So make a covenant with yourself to watch only that which is honoring to God, which is going to bring health to your body. Number next, guard your heart. Guard your heart. Proverbs 4.23 says this, Guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. Remember early on I said Jesus is really not about the spirit of the law. He's about the heart of or he's not about the letter of the law, he's about the spirit of the law. And the spirit of the law gets to the heart, not just words written on a piece of paper that we can say, okay, I did that or I didn't do that. Uh, that might be true by the letter of the law, but by the spirit of the law, we can look lustfully on another person and, and, and commit adultery just as much as we did if we had followed through with that act. And so th this is what he's driving about. Guard your heart. Because if you don't guard it, you're in trouble. If we guard our heart, we protect our heart by doing these things that we're talking about, okay? Man, it will keep us from going down that road. Proverbs 20, 12, another interesting verse. The hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord has made them both. The ears you hear with, the eyes you see with, God has made them. And he intended them for good, he intended them to bring good things into our lives, that we might see the goodness of God, that we might hear the voice of God. But if we allow these other things to get in our way, they, they cause us to be blind to what God wants to do in and through our lives. It, it blocks us, it drowns out the voice of God because of all of these other noises that we're hearing. Last one. Don't do it alone. Don't do it alone. And the truth is, you can't. And some of you know that. You've made these promises before. I'm never going to do this. I'm going to stop doing that. And before you know it, something has happened and you find yourself right back in there. Ecclesiastes 4, 9 through 12 gives us this advice. Two are better than one. We get that, right? 
Makes sense. Two are better than one because they have a good reward for their toil. For if they fall, one will lift up his fellow. But woe to him who is unable or who is alone when he falls and has not another person to lift him up. See, this is what this is all about. He continues. He says, again, if two lie together, they keep warm. But how can one keep warm alone? And though a man might prevail against one who is alone, two will withstand him, and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. Here's what he's driving at. It's all about accountability. It's all about accountability. And every single one of us, myself included, need accountability in our lives. More than just showing up here on Sunday morning, more than just saying, okay, I got this pastor, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do these things. Listen, it, it, if you have problems in this area, then you need to get somebody to walk this with. You need somebody in your life that you can be real with and honest with and ask them to hold you accountable. Every single week, I get an email from an app called Covenant Eyes. A friend of mine several years ago now asked if I would be his accountability partner. And uh, he's a really good friend of mine. And, uh, and, and so his devices, his phone, his computer, laptop are all hooked up to this app that monitors everything that he watches on those devices. And every week I get an email that says, you know, your friend either had a good week or had a bad week or there's an area that you might want to check on or whatever uh, that's questionable. And so my job then, uh, if he's had a good week, oftentimes I'll call and congratulate him and say, hey, man, you had a you know, a whole bunch of weeks in a row, way to go. Or every once in a while, something will, will pop up that I think is kind of odd, and I'll call them and say, okay, hey, I got this report. What was this about? And, and nine times out of ten, it was nothing. They, they just they flagged it because they weren't sure themselves. And, and I only share that to say, listen, we all need that kind of accountability in our lives. There's so many tools out there, so many apps that can be used for, for things like this. Uh, that, that will help hold us accountable. And if you know that somebody's going to call you and hold you accountable to it, you're way more likely to win this battle with lust in your life. So don't think that you can do it alone because you can't. So let me ask you this. What do you have a problem with? What are you struggling with? Is it too much TV? Too much time on social media? It does not always have to be just about the sexual stuff. It, it, it could be you just, you're so caught up in seeing and doing and watching and hearing and looking at other things that it's keeping you from following and looking after and listening to the very voice of God. But identify what that is so that you can over, get real with yourself about this and then consecrate yourself to God. When we uh, earlier today, when we started, and we, we, Chad and the band led us through uh, two really great worship songs this morning, that second song was titled, It's All About You. And here's what I know. When it's all about God in my life, I'm much more likely to win over these kind of battles in my own life. But when we make it all about me and we make excuses for why we're doing it and, and we go, well, you know, I'm only looking. I'm not touching. I'm not, you know, the, the moment we do that, we make it all about us and we're bound to lose and we're bound to, to suffer the consequences that go along with that. And usually those consequences don't just affect us. They affect those around us. And so this morning, I thought as a way to begin this process of consecrating ourselves to God that I've asked Chad and the band to come back out and, and just lead us through a, a portion of that song. And I'm going to ask you to go ahead and stand with me this morning at all of our campuses. If you're watching online, you want to stand up. But, but use this song as the beginning step of consecrating yourself to God. We could all use a fresh start, can't we? We all need God's forgiveness in our lives. And so let's use this song as a prayer today and begin this consecrating process.
Father, every miracle story, every, every healing story, every story of revival, God starts with you. God, the words of, of Joshua just keep echoing in my head that if we would consecrate ourselves to you tomorrow, we're going to see you do amazing things. But God, we've got to first come and get right with you. We gotta be real with you. We gotta to wanna to see that happen. And to do that, God, we've gotta set ourselves apart from the things that have, have gotten in the way of our relationship with you. And so God, today, we declare that it really is all about you. God, that if it's, if it's about us at any level, we're in trouble. But God, when it's all about you, Lord, we get to see amazing things happen. And so, God, I pray that, that all of us who, Lord, are, are, are praying right now would be thinking about what we want to see you do, amazing things in and through our lives. God, I pray that we could, we could just get excited about that for a moment uh, of, of realizing that, God, the, the things that you could forgive us from, the fresh start that you could give us, the healing that could take place in our lives, the miracles that we could see you do in and through us as we consecrate ourselves to you, as we give ourselves fully to you this day. Father God, create in us a clean heart. God, forgive us of our sins because they're many. And God, take your word, and Lord, as we read it, as we meditate it on it, as we just think about all the scriptures that we saw today, God, bring those back to mind today, tomorrow, this week, so that we might not sin against you. Father, we love you, we praise you, we thank you for being the incredible, awesome God that you are. Again, Father, we love you. And we pray all of this in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. And we all agreed together and said, amen. amen, amen. God is good. Let's give it up to God. Can we do that this morning? God bless you and have a great week.